Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe. We got another great show for you all today. You know, I know I keep saying that, but today is special, special. I have as my special guest this afternoon to talk to all of us, Mr. Don Chapman. Hello, John Governor. How nice are you? To see you? It's it's fantastic to have you. You know, you're you're first of all, you are a well-known um, journalist in Hawaii, right? I, I think you worked for years with the... Uh, uh, 13 years as a daily columnist at the Advertiser. Yes. And uh, 22 years as Midweek's editor. And you built, you helped build Midweek into one of the major publications I, in Hawaii. It became the best read paper in the state of Hawaii with more than a half a million readers. Well, I tell you what, a lot of people don't realize that you also have a, you know, a bigger life in the sense that you're also an author. This is actually book number 10, uh, The Godfather of the Story of Larry Mayhow, in his own words. It's The Good Father. Did I say Godfather? Yes. <laughs> well, Good it's a play on words. And, and for those of us, uh, those of you out there who may not be aware of this, is that one of the great injustices, in my opinion, of the... Uh, Contemporary Hawaii was the fact that uh, that uh, that Larry Mihal was uh, was identified as a godfather and, and 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 associated with the negative aspects of all of that. And oh, but your book is called the Good Father. Now, tell us all how. Well, first of all, which means, folks, it's a vindication of uh, of a good man. But tell us how you got started with this. How? Governor, first of all, I want to say that there's a chapter that I did with you, and it's one of my favorite chapters and some great stories, and I hope you'll be able to tell one later. How it all started was at midweek, uh, if, if you remember the columnist, Eddie Sherman. Right, he right. He was Eddie. pals with uh, Larry going back to Eddie's days as a columnist at the Advertiser. Larry was running something called Metro Squad, which was very hands-on oh, policing oh, oh, oh. At, oh. At, at HPD. Um, and the allegations had been made of Godfather, Godfather, Godfather. And Larry, Eddie set up an, an interview with Larry at his ranch on the Big Island, and it turned into a two-part midweek cover story. Okay, good. So that, that's how it started, and that basically takes up the first couple so of So that was how you got to meet Larry uh, Mayhaw. I had met him once previously on an opening day at the legislature, I think at Malama Solomon's office, but it was just a brief hello, hello, and I'd heard the name, and I'd heard the rumors, and I was, hello, and I was off. But then I, I got to go to his ranch, sit down at his kitchen table at the ranch at Waimea with Eddie, and ask him the question, are you the godfather? And? He I'll said, be... no. You know, and, and, it's, and I love your book, okay? I want to talk a little bit about the format of your book, because the first half of your book... And, and folks, this, this is really interesting stuff. I mean, I, I had a chance to read it uh, this weekend. And, and um, you know what you do when you read some, some book? You look for, you know, the part of, that you say something. And then you go back and you start reading it. And I, I just read it. I read it all. I mean, oh, it's just it's, it's, it's fantastic because it starts off, half of the book starts off with Larry telling his own story, where he grew up, who his family was, what you know the whole the whole bit which is so fascinating and then you take them about i think about 11 or 12 different people about 20 20 people and and you have little vignettes about their interaction with 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 uh, Larry Mayhaw and not all of them are could be considered close friends not all of them at all in fact one of them was his arch enemy tell us how this whole thing about the godfather got started it started in uh, 1977, if you remember a journalist named Scott Shirai. Oh, Scott, yes. Uh, Actually a good journalist. I, I, he was a great journalist, had a long list of sources, and on the KHON News, when it was then an NBC affiliate, he reported that the head of a state board had been involved in a heroin bust at Punchbowl Cemetery. Right. And he didn't name names. But, but I tracked Scott down, he's now in Cleveland, and he said, I knew who I had in mind, and it was Larry. Yes. Um, 
And from that point, it was about six weeks later, a guy named Rick Reed ran a little newspaper on Maui called Valley Isle. And he had been backpacking around. Uh, Maui had heard some stories about Larry being involved in uh, a couple of murders. Uh, Mitchell and... Which, by the way, are, are, are not factual. I don't want to even give the impression that this was even... Thank you. ...even charged or anything. But, no, 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 but no, this no, but was, was like a rumor that he had heard. With, with certain people on Maui. And he published it, that Larry was the godfather. Up the ante by saying he was also involved with a gangster out of Chicago and Los Angeles named Marcus Lipsky. Well, so so that was also in 1977, and, and so the allegation was there. Then later, 85, 1985, Reed had been hired by Chuck Marsland at the same. And he really played it up. And he really played it off running for Congress. Well, I tell you, I I, I don't know where to begin because this is such a such an interesting book. But, uh, and what the book does is, is show that that is not correct. That if anything, that Larry's role in law enforcement was uh, very much on the side of enforcing uh, the law as a policeman and then acting as a, uh, I guess you would call it community outreach person uh, or something. <laughs> That's a good way of putting you it. You know? When, when, when Larry was named ahead, something called Metro Squad. There was 12 guys, big local guys, and he put them through martial arts training before they went out every night. Each guy had his own car. They're dressed in jeans and Aloha shirt, and they would crack heads if need be and do Yeah, whatever. it was a time when there were tough cops when, when there were a lot of tough cops. You know. And they needed to be. Um, well, I, I tell you what, I, 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 I know who the Metro Squad was. I grew up going to school when the Metro Squad was in its peak, uh, uh, you know, in, in Honolulu. And guys, I, I never knew until years later that Larry Mihal was part of this Metro Squad, but I knew who the Metro Squad was. Yeah. And they all wore these white kids, you know, these white kids. They would wear white kids, and you would be on the beach, you know, doing what teenagers shouldn't do, like drinking or doing something else on the beach. And all of a sudden, you'd see white kids coming, and you'd be gone. You would disappear. You would be gone. And so, and by the way, they weren't just, they didn't just uh, throw people in jail. I mean, what they did was keep places safe, and, and it, yes. it, it, was a, it was a different Hawaii, but it was a, a place where, you, you know, you just wouldn't do something that you shouldn't if you were in their territory. <laughs> just, and... and People understood Larry, I mean, excuse me, Eddie Sherman tells a, a, a great story in the book. He, he was doing a ride along with Larry one night, and Larry had heard a rumor that there was going to be a gang fight at a downtown dance hall. I, I don't think they have dance halls anymore. Oh, now. right on Hotel Street. I, I, you see, you, you got to remember, you're talking about my era. <laughs> and so I know exactly where this dance hall was. And you know? so Larry goes up to the microphone and he goes, folks, we understand there's going to be a gang fight tonight. I want everybody to line up against the wall, walk single file to the center of the room, and give up your weapons. <laughs> and as Eddie Sherman explains it, you've never heard such a clanking of guns and knives and chains hitting the ground. And people did what Larry wanted them to do. Yeah, and and, and that was good for Hawaii. And and I guess Hawaii. what happened was that in the course of doing all of this. Well, you get to know some of these bad guys, you know? Yes, exactly. Francis, Francis Keala, the former chief of police here, told several people that Larry's reputation is a, directly attributable to what Larry did at HPD. And HPD asked him to go out and mediate gangland disputes, syndicate disputes. And he'd go and sit down two tough guys who, as Larry says, you know these guys, there is no backing down. Yeah. And he would talk to this guy, talk to that guy. And they walk out, shake hands, and they're pals. Well, that was wonderful, you know. But so, okay, so what this book was was an attempt for you to clarify the record. I, That's I, I would exactly say, because right. it 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 really talks about all these community-based things that he had done, you know. Yes, and, and and so he had the reputation. He was called Godfather, and it stung him. It hurt him. He's a big, tough guy, biggest and toughest guy I think I've ever met. And he was stung by this stuff, and yet he well, kept... it was so unjust. Thank you. It was so unjust, you know. And and I and I tell you, and I. Uh, well, 
in my case, for example, um, you know, we, we weren't on the same side politically. In fact, he campaigned against me with uh, annoying regularity. Which is crazy because you're both from the Big Island. You we're both, both have from, we have great backgrounds. great backgrounds. And by the way, but I never be, ever believed or saw any evidence that he was any of the things that people accused him of. In fact, it was the exact opposite. I mean, even my own family, my mom had an interaction with him and he helped her and she would you know no matter what they said about Larry Mihal my mom Mary Purdy Whitehay would immediately correct everybody and say Mr. Mihal is a good man and, and that's how you know and, and she told me she used to tell me regularly you always remember he helped your family you know and uh, so it stuck so, you know, while he was campaigning against me, I had to sort of be nice, <laughs> just so you know that. You and, know. and that's a story that's in the book, by the way, right? Yeah, and, and there's so many stories. But I want to hear about Larry. I want to hear about his life. So tell us a little bit about the guy so, growing up in Hawaii. Uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased. His family helped me with the book. I've got 50 photos of Larry uh, from a barefoot kid in Hilo with rolled up jeans right, right on through. Um, he was the son of a single mom, born out of wedlock, and so Mayhaw was the mom's name. The father was a big five executive. Yes. Larry's never named, and I know the name, and I'm not going to name it. No. Um, so he, he came from that background. He came from a tough background, I mean, uh, uh, but a loving one, apparently, it a, a seemed like. A loving one. His mother's very native, native Hawaiian. And, and even though he grew up on the bayfront in Hilo, he loved horses and being a cowboy, and so every weekend, every holiday, every summer, he was up at Waimea riding horses and learning from the Paniolo up there. Right, right, and that's that, and and so he he also took up sumo. Yes, he took up sumo, um, aikido, and all the martial arts. Took up arts. aikido. He was so good at sumo. He he went on a tour of some local boys up to Japan. He competed in six tournaments and won five. Wow! So he, he, he's the. The big, I mean, you know, what, what is it? Kunishiki, Musashi Maru, Akibono, all of those guys are following in Larry's footsteps. And it started with Jesse Ku, Ku, Kuhalua. Yes, Jesse, right. Uh, Takamiyama. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so Larry had his friends in sumo that he met in Japan, and they said, look for some Big Island boys. And he knew Jesse on Maui, and he tried to talk him into it, and Jesse didn't want to go. And Larry said, what are you going to do? You're going to work on the plantation? Nothing wrong with working on the plantation. Yeah. But if you go to Japan, you're going to become a legend. You're going to become immortal. And which he did. And he did, and it changed the young man's life from out. Changed Hawaii and our relationship yes. with, the, with Sumo and, the, and Japan, for that matter. Yes, and, and so that led on to Akebono and, and the other local Well, boys. I know one thing. I know that from, you know, I spend a lot of time in Japan, uh, you know, especially post-governorship, and, and even while I was governor. And I can honestly say that uh, Larry's name is gold in Japan. Yeah. I mean, people like him, they do business with, they trust him, and they have a legend about how much he can consume. Beef. Beef. Prime beef steak. Yeah, yeah it's like this Kobe beef type, Matsuyaki beef. And he would... Uh, well, there is, right next to the Okura Hotel, there is this, uh, there is this restaurant, that Shabu Shabu restaurant. And if you're from Hawaii, and this is famous, it's a world, f I mean, famous Japanese Shabu Shabu. If you're from Hawaii, they'll immediately tell you about the big guy from Hawaii who consumed something like 27 plates or something. Yeah, now, you got to remember, these are real thin... Uh, which was to cost a fortune, <laughs> but it was like, I could delicious. And he was a big guy with big appetites. Yeah, I, I, I try to consume that much. I couldn't afford it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to take a short break right now. And folks, come on back. we got more interesting stories to talk to you about, about a great new book called The Good Father, the story of Larry Mihal. Nothing is making sense. 
Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner and I'm Beatrice Gantemo and we have come in this series, Young and Older Alike, to take a look at our past, your past and the past that's not seen history books. History books are his story and what we refer to as mirrors of the past, but we as colonized people, indigenous peoples and people of color look into the mirror and do not see ourselves there. On the ties that bind, we will examine those underlying causes. Please join us with the Ties That Bind on Wednesdays at noon, twice a month. We look for you there. Aloha. Aloha. All right, here we are back with Don Chapman, the author of The Good Father, and thank you, Don, for being with us. Tell us a little bit about Larry and his family, and, and so interesting people. I mean, he, he's, he's got a lovely wife. Beverly uh, Rogers was the maiden name. They met at uh, Kamehameha Schools. Larry came over as a boarder in the 10th grade at the boys' school it was then. Right. And Bev was a year ahead, but she started in 7th grade. They dated in high school. Larry graduated in 1948, Bev in 49. They got serious after that, married in 51. Um, and ended up having five children together. Wow. And he had five children, right? And um, unfortunately, a couple of... Two of his three sons preceded him in death. And I believe, and several of the people that I spoke to about the story, including his wife, Bev, believe that the Godfather allegations played a role in that. It just caused so much stress in the family. I can imagine. I can imagine. I know what it's like. You know, there's a terrible price that the family pays when you're a public figure. And, you know, in this country, you know, it's accepted that if you're going to put yourself out there, you're going to have some barbs being thrown on you. But what, what never is calculated is the cost on your family. It was huge. It was huge. huge. And this is and it's such an outrageous... Uh, well, okay, so let, I didn't know that he'd grown up in Hilo, all right? I didn't know any of this stuff. I'm a teenager in the middle of um, growing up in Waimea, in cowboy country, where, you know, just in, like, I, I guess the decade before, Larry had been spending time uh, uh, be playing cowboy. And there's something unique about Waimea. You know, people don't realize this, but... Um, the cowboys up there spoke Hawaiian. So it, it didn't matter what your nationality was. If you were a cowboy, you had to speak Hawaiian to function. And so I can see young Larry going up there and learning these things. By the way, that's why my cousin Larry Kimura, whose father was a Japanese, but who was all cowboy, yes. actually learned how to speak uh, Hawaiian as, as, as great as he, uh, as he does. And because he was a Paniolo. Well, because he was surrounded by this stuff. In fact, I was surrounded by people speaking Hawaiian. I just never was taught it. You know, you have to either pick it up. So this is the kind of background we shared. Now, I didn't know Larry who had gone to this and everything. Meanwhile, I'm living up there. And Larry is a bunch, of, come, gets a homestead, yes. right about the time I'm about a, I, I think I was about 10th grade or 9th grade in, in high school. And, and I was actually in school in, on Oahu. And so, you know, it, what was interesting about him was that he actually knew what to do. He, he uh, could uh, ride a horse. He could ride a horse. He could ride, not like some of the early guys, you know, who came from Honolulu. He and a few others like Kalani Shuti and others basically were, you know, knew what they were doing. And so, anyway, back in those days, if you're, you can't shoot pool, you can't go to a pool hall unless you're 18 years old, right? So I'm gonna tell this, your audience, this story. 18 years old. But lucky for us, one of my friends uh, had a pool, home, pool table at home in this little shed. And we would go there and, and 
bet. Like, you can't play pool. Pool's not fun unless you have a little <laughs> bit to risk, right? And so we would take a little bit of our money, mostly nickels and uh, maybe a quarter. That would be the last big bet. <laughs> big money. Yeah, and, 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 and we'd be shooting. And all of a sudden, my friend's dad walks in with this big Hawaiian guy, and it's Larry B. Hall, you know? And he, we were standing around, oh, no, you know, da 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 da. He says, You want to shoot? You know, so he shoots pool with us. And he takes all our money. He just wins. He's a good pool shooter. And um, when we were done, I was standing around, oh, sorry, we don't have any more money, you know, like this. And he's just in. And then he goes up and he says, Well, okay, he puts the stick away. He reaches in his pocket, takes out all the money he won, and he puts it back on the table. <laughs> And he said, you know, and, he, and we're all looking at him, and he pushes it, and he says, very sternly, he says, that's why you shouldn't gamble. <laughs> and he walks out, you know, and this is Larry May Hall, the famous Larry, this is my introduction to him. And that story is in the book. Yes, thank but you for that. I subsequently learned that he was part of the Metro Squad, which, by the way, it, it, you know, this is the disconnect. I'm, I'm, we play pool on, in Waimea, but the Metro Squad is on Oahu, and I'm going to school on Oahu. That's how I know about the Metro Squad. You know, like, uh, like I say, I guess, in the book, if I had known this was, you know, in fact, I, even then, if he had told, none of you should be doing this, get out of this room, I would have run through the wall. I think I told you that. I would have gone right through the wall. I mean, this was that kind of guy. So, you know... He, in a sense, really personified a generation of people from Hawaii that grew up in a different time, in a time of tremendous change. And he, he overcame a lot of barriers to become quite successful, you know, both as uh, personally and his family. He had a great family. I, I tell you, his... Um, well, you, you know, his reputation is uh, very immaculate in that sense. Yes, and, and so sort of back to the Godfather charges, he was investigated as much as anybody in the state of Hawaii ever, ever has been. And nobody ever found anything that he did wrong. The FBI file ran to 2,000 pages. Wow. And they found nothing wrong. IRS looked at him, nothing wrong. HPD looked at him, nothing wrong. And yet the charges persisted, and so that's... Yeah, and it's all by innuendo, and it's all by, okay, I have my own theory, Don, and I didn't say this in the book. Well, let's hear it then. But uh, I, I do think that a lot of it had to do with kind of a latent racism, okay, and I'm going to say this. A lot of it did with a latent race, racism because he was a tough-looking, big Hawaiian guy. That's it. And you wanted this, Im you know, if you're going to have an image of the boogeyman, the guy that's out there, he, and, he, you know, he, he, he looked the part in a sense. If you, you know, this is, that's why I'm saying, we all are, even those of us that might be Native Hawaiians, sometimes slip into stereotyping. And there's a kind of stereotype going on. This big guy must be. That, I think, coupled with the fact that... Um, he was successful. I mean, he's a guy, you talk about up from poverty, you know, he was a good businessman. I, I know for a fact, I, with some projects that I worked on years later, that, um, you know, the, what he had done with it, uh, not with me, but with others, was, was very, very intelligent, very good. He was a smart businessman. He was, so you had a smart businessman that looked tough, and could talk to everybody, and ran a security company, and it was like everybody that wanted a story loved to talk about this one. Yes. But they don't realize how much it hurt. Larry said it used to drive him crazy. He would walk into a room, into a restaurant, and heads would turn, oh my God, do you know who that is? And, and you could see it, or, or I talked to somebody the other day, Larry walked into a big ballroom, Hush. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's the story, and I forgot about this story. So this is an original. This is an original. 
I'm governor of Hawaii, and I had this thing where I like to go out to these little hole-in-the-wall restaurants and eat Hawaiian food. And there was this place way out in Kalihi called Leong's, great, great luau stew. And I went there for luau stew. So one day, I, I go there and I walk into Leong's, and Larry Mayhaw is in the corner with a few friends, and they're eating uh, lunch. And so obviously I wave and I sit down, and I, I and with uh, I think I was with uh, Chuck Friedman, some some eight of mine, and we're over there, and we just finished lunch, and I get back to my office, and I get a phone call from the advertiser. No. Asking me what was I doing at Leong's with uh, Larry May yeah. Howe. And actually, outside of saying, hey, Larry, how are you doing? You know, like this, we had no, no contact. So I can, I can understand. Word travel that fast. Yeah. The price that that, uh, that, that, that was, uh, wow. was, was uh, you know, that the family would have to pay. By the way, uh, I don't want to get beyond this, but. Um, this book is coming out, yes. yeah, and you're going to have a few uh, signings. Yes, so Island forth. Heritage is the local publisher. And Island nice, Heritage. Nice, nice uh, Kamaaina company. Yeah, good Kamaaina company. I hope, uh, you know, support the, the book and Kamaaina yes. company. So on uh, Saturday, May 5th at uh, 3 o'clock, there's a big book and music festival on the City Hall grounds. Uh, at 3 o'clock, I'll be doing a presentation and then a book signing at 4 at the Barnes & Noble tent. The following Saturday, May 12, 1 o'clock, Barnes & Noble, Ala Moana. I'll be doing a presentation and a signing there, and we're working on some other places as well to do signings. Well, fantastic. Why don't you, um, why don't you just take a little something and uh, give us well, a sense of your book. Let's just take it right to the end, Governor. Okay. And I'll pick this up in sort of what I call my, my afterthoughts. Uh, there, are, there, there comes a time when a lack of any hard evidence requires a squaring of the record. The FBI file alone on Larry runs hundreds and hundreds of pages, really 2,000. And despite all of the bureaus investigating, proves no wrongdoing. Likewise, for investigations from myriad other government agencies, Operation Firebird, which was HPD, and the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration, and Operation Coco, which was the IRS, among others. When a government agency labels an investigation an operation, it's a big deal. Yes. If there yes. were any punishable law breaking by Larry, don't you think there some career minded prosecutor or AG would have pounced? Oh, right. They tried that and failed. Hmm. So that is what the good father attempts the writing of a monumental wrong, lest it become eternal. Better late, I hope, than never. Fantastic. So, everyone, the new book, The Good Father by Don Chapman, and, and it's the story of the life of Larry Mihau in his own words and a few others, actually 20 of us. Uh, many of us, like uh, Congresswoman Pat Psyche is in here. There were classmates in Hilo in the 30s. You got people like Walter Dodds in here. Yes. Three governors, uh, Ariyoshi, Cayetano, and, and myself. And, uh, well, just, and you even got Rick Reed. Tracked him down in Snohomish, Washington, his own old town. The person that town. actually started the lie. Who started you know? it. You know? And uh, so everybody's got a shot, and we get a chance to read about a good man. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Governor, for thank you us. for helping with the book and for this opportunity. Well, I really appreciate your showing up there. And, you know, you're proud of anybody from my hometown. That's so right. here we are, Why Male Boys, one more time. That's it.